Good afternoon. Welcome to the last forum. Have you enjoyed them? Yes. Great. Uh, you're going to enjoy this today. This is a special treat. Josh England is the president of CRA Kentucky, and he is also a member of the uh, Federal Reserve Board of Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're still on there, aren't you? Yeah. Josh is going to talk about how you uh, keep a family business um, in a very tough industry, going and growing, and being innovative. And without any further ado, I'm going to turn the time over to Josh England. Thank you, Rick. Rick's my good friend, and I see the, uh, the Ute gear here. We, uh, we spent a lot of uh, games uh, up yes, there together. So. Uh, anyway, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I think it's, these are entrepreneurial uh, lectures and, and I'm here to, to tell our story, my family's story, about a, a Utah um, entrepreneurial story and, um, and, and kind of our experience that went along, along the way with that. So let me jump into a few slides here and I'm open to questions anytime. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, wanted to start out with a little video here that will tell part of our story. Let's see if the sound works. The story of C.R. England begins in 1920, when Chester R. England, a Plain City farmer eager for a better way to make a living, began hauling produce from Weber County and Cache Valley, Utah, to markets in Salt Lake City. Over the course of the next four decades, Chester and his two sons, Gene and Bill, grew a modest one-truck outfit into a solid transportation business. Their trucks hauled potatoes from Idaho, bananas from Mexico and Central America, and produce from the irrigated farmlands of California and Arizona to markets on both coasts and everywhere in between. Through a depression, a world war, and countless economic cycles, this small family operation grew steadily into a national brand symbolizing high-quality transportation solutions. Of course, uh, this was a dream. Uh, it wasn't a big dream in those days. We didn't uh, visualize anything like, uh, like England is today, but uh, that's just made it that much more wonderful. Today, CR England has transitioned corporate leadership to the third and fourth generation of the England family led by CEO Chad England. Through the generations, CR England has grown into the largest refrigerated transportation company in the United States, with the most efficient and cost-effective solutions. The company currently has five operating divisions, national and regional over-the-road services, cross-border services to and from Mexico, dedicated contract carriage, and intermodal, our fastest growing and most innovative business division. Our double stack intermodal service called TempStack offers cost savings, consistent and reliable transit, 24 seven monitoring, and provides vital additional capacity to the refrigerated transportation market. Since 2010, when the first intermodal container was purchased to today, the TempStack container fleet has grown over 450%. The innovative new containers ride on a nationwide network of expedited priority trains and are complemented by industry-leading drayage trucks. Together, they are 60% more fuel efficient than over-the-road trailers and deliver reliability and quality to our customer supply chain. CR England is dedicated to continued innovation and excellence. With a focus and dedication of all employees what and drivers, there's no limit to what we can achieve together. Okay, so that, uh, that's a little bit about how we began. Um, the, who knows where Plain City, Utah is? Anybody been there? I see one hand. Small town. So uh, it's up uh, west of Far West or Ogden, um, and it was a very small town. And we began there, I think I've got some stats here. So Plain City, today the population is a little less than 6,000 people. And um, it's kind of amazing what happened there. So we started there in 1920. 
and uh, it was uh, Chester, as you saw in the video. He was a farmer and wanted to, to find a different way to make a living. The story goes that he was at the dinner table and, and uh, he didn't know where tomorrow's meals were going to come from. Times were very tough in the pre-depression era there. And, um, and, and he actually broke down in tears wondering how he was going to provide for his family. And he hatched a plan that he would, in, instead of growing the product, he would start hauling it from farm to market. And so we started with, with just very humble beginnings like that. Um, and, uh, and it started here in uh, Plain City, Utah. And incidentally, you may recognize a couple of those other logos up there. Those are uh, logos you'll see on big trucks around the country. And uh, so those are some of the biggest fleets in the country, and they all have their roots from Plain City, Utah. Um, you can see uh, almost 32,000 uh, drivers and staff work for that collection of companies, ours included, uh, that come from that very small town. So we are a Utah story. We grew up uh, here in Utah. We, re we remain headquartered here in Utah. We're headquartered in Salt Lake City, um, just over um, by Bangor Highway there. Um, so we, uh, let me go back a couple here, covered that. So then uh, Gene, or, uh, Chester had two sons, Gene and Bill, you see them pictured there. And th like I said, if, this was a very humble company. They worked very hard. Uh, they, they were drivers and they blowed the, the trucks. And, and uh, uh, Gene, you see pictured on the left of the two brothers there, he's my grandfather. And his goal when he w left for World War II was to save enough money throughout the war that when he came back he could buy their second truck, you know, and grow up from one to two trucks. And the way he did that was he sold his cigarette rations all throughout the war. And he had saved up enough to buy that second truck. And uh, so that's kind of how we grew back then, just little by little, and just kind of scraped out a living. Um, when. Uh, Back before the interstate highway system was built, it was very difficult to uh, navigate the country. And we were the first to offer 72-hour coast-to-coast service. We've always been a real long-haul oriented uh, company uh, hauling products coast-to-coast. -coast. And uh, so that was kind of the uh, claim to fame for the company back then. And then uh, really the industry was deregulated in, in 1980 and that really became our opportunity. We were a very small carrier at the time, had about 150 trucks and when they deregulated they then let everybody compete in every freight lane. Before that you had to petition the government to have authority to haul freight in any certain freight lane and uh, so when that when those barriers were eliminated suddenly uh, you had this, you know, the whole world was the, the possibility for you. You could go out and, and do anything you wanted and haul freight anywhere. So it was a great opportunity. But of course with that came, everybody else was wanting to do that. So tons of competition. And, and, uh, and so freight rates, when you have all that supply, you know, of trucks come into the market and you have the same amount of freight moving, what happens to freight rates, to prices? They drop, right? Supply demand. So, so they drop big time. And uh, if you look at a list of the biggest carriers at the time, uh, the top 10 list, I don't think there's one that has survived today, that's still in business today. They couldn't adapt to the changing market. You know, their, their cost structures were fat. They were used to the protected uh, rates that they had, the protection that they had from the regulations. Well, that all was removed and suddenly it was uh, it, it kind of went to whoever could perform best and, and manage their cost best and uh, so for us it was it, for everybody it was a very difficult time I remember uh, I'm 38 years old actually today my birthday so um, thank you <laughs> so uh, I remember when I was a kid back in the early 80s I remember driving around with my dad uh, looking for a place that we could put a car wash because I remember him saying Times are so tough in trucking, I'm not sure this is going to work and we need a plan B. And uh, so times were very, very tough and, and um, we were a very small company and, um, and we're, we're so fortunate that, that uh, we didn't have to go to that plan B, but things have worked out and, and we've, we've really been able to grow and capitalize on the, on the marketplace here. So here's a profile on us today. Uh, we're the fifth largest employer in Utah. We have about 4,300 tractors in service. and over uh, almost 8,000 trailers in service. We have those containers. You saw in that video a lot of emphasis on intermodal where we, we uh, partner with the rail and put our containers on the rail and, and, and haul it part of the way that way. 
that, that video actually was created for, uh, for Kraft, a big customer of ours who we were trying to win a big intermodal contract with. So it had a lot of emphasis on the rail side of things. Um, and fortunately, we, we got the contract, but um, that's a growing part of our business. Uh, you see 7,000 drivers and, and, um, and we have driver schools around the country. We have 80 locations around the country. Our annual revenues will do about 1.7 billion this year uh, in revenues. We are a growth company, a growth story. So back from when we were, uh, like I said, when we were driving around wondering if the company was going to survive, to now we've grown so much. Uh, and here's our trend on revenue over the last uh, about nine years here. Um, so we'll, we'll be to uh, 1.7 billion this year. And so we'll talk a little bit about how we got there and, uh, and love to answer any questions you have as well. Um, so we, we break up our company into to three main groups. Uh, there's England, North America. That's, uh, if you go out on the road, if you see the big red trucks, some of you may recognize those. Um, they are in that England, North America group. And they do uh, primarily over the road transportation. So it's kind of one way transportation. You haul something that a customer wants you to, from, to move from uh, point A to point B, then you find another customer to take you from point B to point C. So we kind of bounce all around the country in Mexico doing that. And then we have uh, England Logistics, which is our um, non-asset based uh, transportation company. So most people don't realize that this, is ev that this even exists, but much of the freight that moves around the country has an intermediary involved. So it's like, think of it like a stockbroker. So, we're the broker and we hire all these other trucking companies to move the freight so we buy their services for one rate we sell it to big shippers for another rate so it's like we bundle all their uh, capacity to haul freight and we mark that up a bit and sell it to uh, to large shippers who couldn't uh, access all those small carriers so we have 15,000 carriers who haul freight for us so it's a way that we can really expand without having to uh, buy a ton of trucks so um, so that's that business and then we have a lot of other businesses that we kind of group into this other business units area it includes uh, uh, a finance company where we finance a lot of those small carriers um, and, and, and a variety of other uh, kind of smaller entities all related to transportation like a hotel and a clinic and a whole variety of things that kind of support the effort um, so within England North America here are, uh, here are our, our divisions. So we have regional that handles certain regions around the country but keeps them in real tight closed loops geographically. Uh, national is the one that bounces all across the country. That's traditionally been our biggest uh, business unit. Mexico does a lot of the cross-border business in Mexico. That's such a growing area um, and, uh, and has been a great thing for us. Uh, dedicated is where we, we decided, well, let's go to, uh, let's say, a Walmart. Uh, type customer um, and and they have these distribution centers around the country have you guys ever seen the one down by st. George yeah huge I mean it's just amazing the uh, the, the amount of equipment that's in there to haul freight and the size of that facility um, but we'll go to a distribution center and we'll say hey let us handle all your transportation from that distribution center and we'll devote you know a hundred two hundred trucks whatever just to that center and so we've got a lot of those going and so that's now become our biggest division and they do nothing but say Walmart freight in that example just bouncing around the country for Walmart um, so that's dedicated intermodal you saw in the video and you see in the picture there is these double stackable refrigerated containers um, and that's that's been a great story we just started that in um, in 2010 um, and and we now have uh, about 1650 uh, of these containers running around the country and and the next closest has I think 350 and so it's been a real entrepreneurial opportunity for our business a mature business but you know a new product line that we can really jump into and and uh, and grow what do you think the advantages are of doing it through intermodal through the rail any thoughts saving some of the fuel uh, yeah absolutely so you save a lot of money on fuel yep Uh -huh. I mean, that's a huge market right now. Absolutely. It's a very big market. Yeah. Any other advantages you think of? Yeah. I think a lot less maintenance because you don't have to upkeep the trucks, cars, tires, and all that. True also. Yep. Good thought. Any others? You're stacking those. 
Most trucks only pull with one trailer, so. That's right. Yeah, so it's more, more efficient, right? Yeah. So you can uh, kind of get it moved for more efficiently and therefore with a cheaper cost, right? So, so traditionally what they do on the rail is they, they'll take just our regular refrigerated trailer and they'll just throw that right on a flat uh, trailer car and it's not stacked, you know, and, and so they'll move them that way. And, and you're absolutely right, this double stacking element has created this brand new efficiency that, that's been huge. It's also great for um, environmental reasons. You know, you're not burning as much fuel throughout that whole thing. It's great for traffic congestion. So, so those, those are some of the things that went into our decision to start moving that way. Uh, England Logistics, I mentioned this is the one that I compared to like a stock brokerage. And, uh, and we do business there in, in all these different modes that you see. We do business around the world in this business. Um, not just road traffic, but, uh, but, but air, um, water, you know, those, those types of uh, uh, modes as well. And uh, so it's been a great thing for us. So here are some of our main customers. You'll recognize a lot of these names. Uh, we primarily work with the large, the largest customers, the Fortune 500 customers, who have a lot of, of refrigerated product that needs to be moved around the country. We have a real specialty in refrigerated product. We do a lot of others, but, but that's the thing that we uh, have the biggest specialty in. Um, let's talk about sustainability. So, many people think of um, trucks as and diesel trucks as, you know, big. Uh, you know, gas guzzling trucks that spew out all the dark smoke and that was certainly true at one time and there, there are people out there still driving those types of trucks, right? Um, but we have dramatically um, improved that element in our fleet and uh, there, are, there are rules that have gotten very much tighter in this regard on, on emissions and, and, uh, and you can kind of see from the lines there and the dates at the bottom how much emission uh, emissions were allowed before versus now, and uh, so you can see, you know, an 85 percent drop in in NOx nitrous oxide, um, and then another 14 percent drop with the latest round of, of regulations, uh, and then on on the uh, particulates, a 90 percent, and then another 9 percent. So you know, 99 percent reduction. In particulates, we run all new tractors, so we have nothing older than than about uh, well than four years old. Um, there are some still out there who are running the old trucks, where you still have some of that. That's true, but but ours are all you know up to these standards that you see here. Um, in fact, it's uh, it's pretty amazing. You see those stats there. It's pretty amazing. You can. If you put 60 of our trucks today and idled them, they'd put out the same amount of emissions as one truck from uh, 1988. Um, so I mean, it's just pretty incredible the the improvements that we've been able to make there. 61. 60 trucks, yeah, oh, wow. yeah. So uh, and, and this continues to improve. We're do, we're doing a lot of things uh, even beyond the emissions to try to cut fuel usage, and therefore, uh, you know, that that cuts. Uh, you know the dependency we have on on oil, and uh, you know, and, and um, certainly it's good for the environment to cut that. So, how did we get here? You know, I, I'd say it. Um, you can see where I'm going with this on on the people front, um, but let, let me say a few more things about that beyond that. So, you know, it really started, like I said, with one guy who uh, who wanted, who was creative and wanted to find a different way to make a living, and First and, f and uh, first and foremost, really wanted to work hard, you know, and, and so we worked extremely hard and, and helped build this business, and then uh, and then we brought on a lot of other people who who have built it, and and you know, as you get involved in business and, and you go, you recognize that you are um, as great or as poor as your team, you know, and, and so you've got to surround yourself with absolutely the best people you can find. There are some people who are afraid to surround themselves with the best people because they may overshadow them, right? Um, and I think to the contrary, uh, you will look so good as your team performs well. Um, and so that's really the key to our business is people. And uh, I think uh, probably any business would say that. And it's a matter of how you differentiate yourself um, from the other businesses with your people. So. We do a lot of different things uh, in this regard. So we have a uh, Reaching the Summit program, 
you see kind of pictured here. So employees start out at base camp and they have things that they can do, things they can learn, soft skills. Um, uh, there's instruction they go to and hear about. Uh, they, there are things that they can read and then they can progress through these camps, camp one, camp two, camp three, camp four, and then summit. And uh, they all have plaques on their desks to kind of show where they are. You know, so we try to invest in our people um, to, to uh, help improve that team. Uh, our leadership philosophy, we, uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to go into great depth and bore you with that, but, but I'll, I'll just say a, a few things about it. So this is a document that, that we use to uh, train people on, on our leadership philosophy. And, and I'll, I'll cover a few of the main things that, that we're about. Um, accountability, you know, most people when they come to our business, that's, this is the first thing that they uh, point out is the way we do accountability um, kind of more rigorously than, than most. So we're just huge believers that um, accountability is vital to performance. So, you know, when you give someone an assignment, there needs to be a return and report opportunity. Um, otherwise, you just don't get the same level of response. And uh, so the way we do accountability, we don't just talk about it. We have a process by which we, we make sure this happens. So every employee has a one-on-one -on -one meeting with, with their supervisor. We, we, uh, many of them are weekly, some are every two weeks, um, where they talk about how things are going. And these are two-way feedback sessions. You know, we want to hear what that, what that employee is experiencing and how we can clear the path for them and, and help them. Um, but it's also opportunity to provide direction uh, to them on, on ways that they can improve and, and have them account for how they're doing. So then, then monthly there's an accountability meeting and, and people have scorecards. You know, it's like a, a letter grade, you know, and, and they can see how they're doing and, and they can see the results of their efforts. Um, and then we have, uh, we have semi-annual employee reviews. So people have a, a review and they can talk about what they're working on, how they're trying to improve. And accountability for some people is a, uh, a bad word. Um, you know, they, when they hear it, they kind of cringe and think, oh no, I'm gonna get my chops busted. Um, with us, it's not that way. I mean, certainly sometimes there are tough issues you've got to address, but accountability gets to where it's such a process that it's not a, a negative thing. Um, in fact, it's a great opportunity to share positive things. Um, and, and appreciate people for what they're doing and recognize them for what they're doing. Um, so accountability is a huge part and I'd say an absolute key to success, at least in our business. Um, communication, you know, we, uh, let me, let me kind of open it up to you guys. What are some of the elements of communication that you think are important in a business like ours? Listening. Listening, great, absolutely. We, uh, you know, we, we have got to stay connected with what's happening. One way we try to do that, just uh, last week I was out pulling a load from here to Chicago, you know, trying to, I have a, a commercial driver's license and as do uh, my, my brothers and uncles and, and, uh, and so we get out there and we like to, to get out there with the drivers and, and pull loads and hear what they have to say. So we need to stay connected to the business. So absolutely, that's a great one. Other thoughts? Various modes of communication, like different, you know, I guess different avenues of or their email, phones, I mean, just different ways to communicate. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, I think that's absolutely right. You gotta make sure you're uh, efficient in it and some of those, those methods of communication is, have helped make us much more efficient. Other thoughts on communication that may be important to a business like ours? Timely okay. communication. Timely communication, yeah, absolutely. You gotta stay on the same page. Uh, another one is we, we are just very open with each other. Um, I'd say the number one problem that, that we see in managers is they're afraid to confront tough issues. So let's say they have someone on their team who is doing something wrong or, or just isn't quite uh, pulling their weight. Managers so often just tend to just live with it, you know, over time. And man, you find that if you can just get that out in the open, we, we just like to just very directly talk about what's going on, good and bad, and then give that person an opportunity to improve it, and more often than not, then they will improve it, right? And so we're just kind of brutally honest, brutal isn't the right word, but we're just very direct, you know, about what are we seeing. And so that, I think that's a very important principle in business. 
Um, another one is we're just very open with our results. We think the team has to know what the score is in order to play better, right? And so we're very open with our results, our financial results, all of our results with our employees. Okay, so that's communication. Hard work. So I mentioned, uh, you know, the family and how Chester, way back, uh, really what made him special was his hard work. And uh, I'll tell a quick story about Gene, my grandpa, who you saw interviewed on the video. Um, he's 94 years old, and, uh, and he still goes to work every day. Uh, he, uh, uh, he's in great health. His secret to health is walking three miles a day. Um, in fact, I was talking to him the other day, and I asked him how his health is, and somehow the conversation turned to uh, uh, medication. And he's never had a period in his life where he took medication other than just like for a cold, you know. Um, he, he's just a, a great model of health, you know, so he's fortunate in that regard. But he's also, part of what makes him fortunate in that regard is he's such a hard worker. So he goes to work every day. He hasn't been involved in the trucking business for like 30 years. But he, uh, in his late 80s, he started a car leasing business where he leases cars to our drivers. And he now has like uh, almost 900 cars out on lease. And the problem is our drivers live everywhere but in Utah, right? We, we have them all over the country. And so invariably we get some of these cars scattered around the country. And you can guess who the repo man is. He's the, he's the guy, so he'll go out and <laughs> he'll go all over the country and, and, and go repossess these cars and he always ends up friends with them and, and leaves them something behind. Uh, but, but he's a very hard worker and that's what's built our business is hard work. Innovation. How do you think you stay innovative when you're a mature business that's successful? Got to be open to new ideas. Yeah, absolutely. How do you do that though? How do you stay open to new ideas? Hire new talent, that's a great one, yeah. Yeah, bring in people with fresh perspectives and listen to them, right? right? Planning so, ahead. What's that? Planning ahead. Planning ahead, that's great. Don't just be reactionary, right? Mm -hmm. Look at the marketplace and say, hey, here's an opportunity, let's go grab it. You know, that intermodal example I told is, is an example of that. We were kind of seeing what's going on with fuel prices and, and, uh, and everything else going on with drivers. And, and we said, hey, this is a real opportunity to go out there and grab a marketplace. Good. Any other thoughts on how you can remain innovative even after you're successful? Yeah? Thinking out the technology. Yeah. changes. Absolutely. That's a great one. You know, you've probably noticed around town, I can think of a couple examples, businesses that were really successful, like, 20 years ago, we're on top 20 years ago, and they didn't change, right? Technology is one of the big ways that you see them not change. And then they're just kind of coasting, and, and eventually they lose that spot, right? They, someone else comes up and takes that spot. So it's really challenging when you're on top to stay on top, because you gotta stay, you can't get, uh, get comfortable and get complacent and rest on your laurels. You gotta, you gotta make sure you're always open to new ideas, new technologies, great, great thought. So we've, we've tried to do that with innovation, and, and we try to teach that in our group. Execution. Um, you know, has anybody read the, the book, uh, Franklin Covey, uh, Four Disciplines of Execution? I see a head nod here, yeah? Did you like it? Yeah. yeah? So uh, the point it makes, and, and uh, that I'll repeat, is that the problem in most businesses isn't the wrong strategy. Um, yeah, a few businesses get the wrong strategy, but mostly businesses get a good strategy. The problem in most businesses is execution. So, um, you know, it's, it, what you find is, is you get so busy with the urgent things that come up, right? We all, uh, w when you're working in a job, you've always got urgent things, fires you're putting out that demand your time. Um, but then you can also think of initiatives, you know, things that you want to improve, kind of more the, the important but not urgent, right? And so often those things get choked out by the urgent. And also often you try to focus on so many initiatives, so many improvement initiatives, that you can't really do any one of them with excellence. You know, and so uh, with execution, we believe in really limiting that focus on the improvement initiatives to like one or two. So like our focus this year is on driver turnover and we're trying to improve driver turnover. And we have everybody in the company focused on that. We have, um, let's see, it's 158 teams, I think, of five to 15 people each that meet every week just about that. 
and we've tried to create urgency, you recognize this from the book, create urgency where there is none naturally. So um, normally the, the, the fires that you have to put out, they take over, right? And so we do it through process, that we try to create urgency of, around one wildly important goal for that year. And so execution is such a huge differentiator between businesses. And uh, so each of those people in those teams of five to 15 people, they make a commitment every week that has something to do with driver turnover, something they can do to help driver turnover. Now, do you think having, you know, 1,500 people all focusing on something they can do each week uh, to make a difference there, do you think that makes a difference? It's incredibly powerful, right? You get that many people aligned to one important thing. So uh, that's execution. Values. Man, you know, values are just absolutely critical to, to uh, maintain your values. Uh, life is long. You're going to end up, if you, if you end up uh, offending somebody or doing something wrong, man, that comes back around. That's not the reason you hold to your values. You hold the values because they're important uh, innately. But certainly, uh, it, it also is helpful to, to build those good relationships that come with holding to your values because those relationships come back around. So. We, uh, we, we feel very strongly about sticking to our principles of we got to do what's right for our people. We got to do what's right for the community. It's not about, you know, always about the almighty dollar. So um, example, um, and this is, I think, a great uh, thing for as you guys are preparing to be managers or already are managers. Um, what, what role do you think example plays in management? What's that? Major how role. so? Tell me how. If people don't believe that you live your word, they aren't going to follow what you say. Like, I mean, That's right. If people listen to your actions, they don't listen to what's coming out of your mouth. That's absolutely they right. You they won't respect you either if you're saying one thing, doing another. It's yeah. absolutely right. Any of you involved in small or in uh, family businesses? Okay, I see a few hands. So. Um, we've got certainly a lot, a, a lot of experience in family business ourselves, and love to hear your experience as well. You know, um, one of our experience uh, or learnings is that, boy, we've just got to uh, fight entitlement, right? It, you can't it, it, when you're involved in a family business. You just cannot have an entitlement problem. Um, other people see that and that hurts the performance, right? And so what we teach all of our family members who are involved in the business is you've got to be that example. You have to follow the rules even more so than the regular employee. Just because you have ownership in the business doesn't mean that you're not an employee who has to follow the rules. So example's huge. I see a hand. So how do you feel about like, um, like you know, when families have been involved in the business, you know, everybody have agreed to a certain level and everything. Like how do you deal with that? So, um, great question. Do you guys create a contract? Look, this is, this is what your portion is in the company, or like, how you guys go about dealing with the situation? Because like yeah. I know, like, when a company start making a lot of money and you have family involved, and that can mess up friendships and, you know, family relationships and the things in that nature. So, it's just, I just want to know how you guys come about. Yeah, great question. Now, as the pie gets bigger, isn't it easier to divide? No, right? It's not. Is it? You would think as the pie gets bigger, it's easier to divide because everybody gets a little more. But that's absolutely not true, right? Uh, you've got to just really focus on keeping the right relationships and the right practices. So a few of the things we do. I mentioned we really fight entitlement. Employment and, and uh, ownership are two separate things. If you're an employee, you got to act like an employee. You got to follow the rules. You got to work hard. You got to do all those things. You're going to be paid a market rate. Okay, there, there are a lot of, um, we joke, maybe a little less than market rate um, as a family member employee. So, uh, but th there are a lot of family businesses where they just say, hey, all the family members have equal authority, right? They have equal pay, equal authority. So then where does the buck stop, right? What, do you think those, are, those businesses function well? No. Probably not, right? I, I know of several examples uh, of family businesses that went down because of this issue. They just refuse to have a, a standard hierarchy where uh, you've, you've uh, got a boss, basically, who, and where decisions are made. And uh, so in our business, we have, um, uh, you know, brothers reporting to brothers, sons reporting to dads. Uh, we have cousins reporting to cousins. We have uncles reporting to nephews. 
we have, you know, so we have all sorts of, you know, we have uh, situations where, you know, age doesn't necessarily drive it. You have, you know, you can have older brothers reporting to younger brothers. You can have, you know, we, I don't know why, we don't make girls in our family. So uh, we have, we've had like all boys. So uh, <laughs> we have had really any girls uh, come into the business. But um, anyway, so I think that's one way is a standard hierarchy where, when you're at work, you're an employee, you get paid a market rate, and you have you report to someone, whether that person is your son or your uncle or your niece or whoever. Do you think, do you think like having like an outsider come in and kind of like uh, holding a management position like that is a good thing? Or? Yeah, I mean, we have, we have non-family uh, uh, executives, and we've told them, as long as you're doing your job well, you're not going to be displaced by a family member. You know, and that's critical that you have non-family people involved. We view, you know, our business is, has grown to where we can't just have family members uh, do it. Plus, we want the perspective of others. Um, so anyway, that, that's one way is through employment rules. We, uh, you can't, as a family member, you can't go in uh, work for the, the company if you don't have a four-year degree. Most of them get master's degrees. Uh, you can't... Uh, uh, work for the company unless you've worked somewhere else for a couple of years. Um, so we have a few rules like that and then just ultimately it's managing those relationships. Uh, we try to, to do buyouts periodically to keep the ranks, the numbers of actual people who own the business small because the more of those you have the more likely you have conflict. So those are a few of our strategies. Good question. So Anyway, those, those are some of our uh, leadership philosophies. Um, I'll just say a couple words about the Federal Reserve. Uh, you asked me last time to do that, so I'll, I'll say a couple things there and then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, so I'm on the board of directors of the uh, Federal Reserve branch here in, in Salt Lake. And uh, basically uh, what we do is we tell the Fed what we're seeing in business. You know, in transportation around the country, we. We're kind of a leading indicator. We see what's going on with the movement of freight and therefore what's happening in the economy. So we share that information with the Fed and it helps them in their policy making. Um, we also hear from the Fed economists. It's great every month at our board meetings we have these Fed economists come in. These are some of the world's most accomplished economists, you know, come in and tell us what they're seeing and show us the the numbers on, on uh, trends that they're seeing. And so we do that. But the Federal Reserve is um, its function is different from fiscal policy, so it's monetary policy. Fiscal policy is setting tax rates, setting spending rules, you know, budgets, spending, all that kind of stuff. Fiscal policy is where we have a giant imbalance on deficits and all that, right? The Fed isn't involved in any of that. The Fed does monetary policy, which is basically um, interest rates, so it, it, it controls through its discount rate basically what level interest rates are at and tries to uh, optimize um, unemployment and inflation, you know, try to achieve low unemployment and not let inflation get too high or too low. So, so that's what, what uh, the Fed focuses on and I try to provide what guidance I have, you know. I'm certainly no expert at that, but I can tell them what I'm seeing and that helps inform their decisions. Uh, so there's been, the Fed's been in the news a lot, you know, with the, uh, anybody heard of quantitative easing? Um, you may have heard that term, and, and uh, basically everybody has an interest in whether the Fed is going to lower or raise interest rates uh, at any one time, and so it's always in the news, um, and so it's been a very interesting journey for me on that. So um, uh, maybe just one more comment about that. Monetary policy in the U.S. right now is driven by two fears. One is um, the uh, basically deflation. So this happened to Japan where if you think your dollar is going to be worth more six months from now than it is today, are you going to spend that dollar? You're not, right? You're going to hold on to it because it's going to be worth more in six months. So that's when you have deflation. That's what happened to Japan and it kills your economy because people stop spending money. So the Fed is interesting in, interested in stimulating things enough to where inflation doesn't get too low to where it teeters on deflation. So that's, that's the number one driver. The second driver is to avoid high inflation. Um, and by the way, this deflationary cycle, that's what happened in the Great Depression, too. Um, so those tend to be the biggest problems that are hardest to end. Inflation is kind of what happened in the U.S. in the 70s and the 80s. Inflation goes way up, rates, interest rates go way up. They try to avoid that through these policies. So, What's yes? your education background? 
So I went to University of Utah and my degree in management and then I went to Notre Dame for an MBA. Awesome. Yeah. So with all those trips, you have to have licensing for every driver that's driving them? Or? Licenses? Yeah. So to do that, that's our biggest challenge in business is finding enough truck drivers. You know, you would think with high unemployment in our country that people would want a job. Well, uh, many would rather collect unemployment um, <laughs> and not work. Uh, but but also it's it's a tough job. It's a, you know it's a challenging job. You got to work very hard. But anyway, we have driving schools around the country. We have five driving schools where people come in and learn how to do it. They take their commercial driver's license tests, and then they go through our training programs to become drivers. I'm going to throw this out to the forum. If you were uh, looking uh, to be a truck driver and uh, you had an example who had a chauffeur's license and who would be in the truck with you, would you uh, look at that as a, a positive thing? That's on his example. Josh drives the truck, can drive the truck, he's got a chauffeur's license. And uh, when you talk about Stephen Covey, one of the books that you should read is Seven the seven habits of highly effective people. One of those habits is sharpening the saw. That means that you're always looking to keep the saw sharp, to find other opportunities, and to be better at what you do. Do you think uh, <clears throat> CR England sharpens the saw? Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The last thing we want to do is, Josh, what do you want to be when you're 48? Now that you're 38 today. <laughs> I'll, I want to be in the same role, but I want our business to accomplish great things. Yeah. Okay. Let's give a, a, a big hand to Josh. <laughs>